这是的。The chairman of the Oxford Union, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me say first of all that it's a great pleasure for me to be invited to this great institution. I've been waiting for this for a long time. And for the last 10 years, I was wondering when I would be invited. So I'm glad to finally be invited to address the Oxford Union. Let me say in the interest of transparency that I'm interested in education. I grew up in a family where my parents were educators. I myself have spent all my life in higher education, as you know. Several universities, at seven universities on three continents, teaching the discipline of law. In my own country, I also served as means of education, uh, so I have that interest. And recently, I've been serving on the Global Commission on Education, chaired by Right Honorable Gordon Brown. So I'm very interested in education, and I thought today. We should talk about education, and the title of my topic is Education for Empowerment. I want to open this discussion with a question of education beyond the classroom, because that is what I want to conclude with. I want us to think about education in a broader sense. In that sense, Education is the software of any society. It is what programs us to see the world the way we do and conduct ourselves the way we do. In planning foundations of any society, the first question should be what type of education do we intend to offer and for what objective? For Africa and much of the developing world, this question is imperative because for more, than, for more than a century, our education was designed to disempower and stagnate us. In a sense, the African situation today is a product of its education. However, it is impossible for us to speak about the history of education in Africa without thinking about colonialism. On 2nd February, 1835, Lord Macaulay presented a minute on Indian education in the British Parliament. He proposed the use of education in order to create Indians who are, and I quote, Indians in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in the intellect, end of quote. This is how human psychology in the colonies was programmed. Education was an imperial weapon of domination. The testimony that follows makes this very clear. In spite of contested authorship, whether it is Lord William Bentick or Lord Thomas Macaulay, who said these words, it tells us how colonial education was structured to achieve its goals. It says, and I quote, I've traveled across the length and breadth of Africa, and I've not seen any person who is a beggar, who is a thief. Such wealth as I've seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber, but I do not think we should ever conquer this country uh, unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. And therefore, I propose that we press her old and ancient education system, her culture, for if Africans think that everything that is foreign is good and greater than their own, they'll lose their self-esteem. Their native culture, and they will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nation." End of quote. Now, that is how the spirit of the continent was captured 
and killed through colonial education. This is a genocide of the spirit. Up until this day, there are many Africans driven by the beliefs, but everything foreign and Western is greater than their own. The worst is that we lost ourselves. Men lost faith in themselves and the cardinal truth that the salvation of Africa can only be laid by Africans. We're made to forget that no one owes us any existence and whatever charity comes to Africa is nothing but charity. This colonization of the mind was supported by well-founded institutions, including universities. The investor was a major factory for producing discourses that shaped and dominated the colonized mind. Let's admit there is no history that can be washed away in human existence. Colonialism was a complex history that cannot be erased by demolishing the statue of an imperialist who built the very halls in which you sit and learn about evils of imperialism. But suppose we take down that dark blot of our past. What do we do with the many buildings that Cecil Rhodes built in this university? The buildings that we have to use. I take it that you have read the will of Cecil Rhodes and seen the treasure he invested in this university. This was the money he got from the so-called poor Africa. The point is this. We cannot change the fate of Cecil Rhodes, a man whom fate had it, that he must be a student of this university just as you are. While we cannot change the fate of Cecil Rhodes, we can change the fate of those who continue being victims of the past. They change fresh for questioning, even if it means self-interrogation. Ladies and gentlemen, the question I bring today is, what type of education do we need to economically and mentally emancipate generations whose past education was designed to dominate them? I will answer this question by illustrating what we are doing in Malawi. First, we need an education that goes beyond the classroom. We need an education whose objective it's not simply to qualify and certify individuals. It must be an education that aims at building capabilities of the people. We must aim at empowering the people with skills. We must remember that Africa is not a poor continent, although its people are poor. Even Malawi is not a poor country. Every year, South Southern Africa alone receives about 134 billion US dollars in loans and development aid. But 192 billion is taken out back to developed countries. We have the resources, but what we lack are the skills for turning our assets into capital. That the knowledge that skills that we need. But I will tell you one thing that has been happening. For a long time, every student who went to school in Malawi was supposed to know who discovered the Congo. Let me repeat, who discovered the Congo? Or who discovered Lake Malawi? The Congo was supposed to be discovered by some foreign colonialists, although the people were already there in Africa. So that's the irony of what I'm trying to say. This is a kind of education colonialism left and was adopted for a long time. I remember, as a young man, the first book I read was called Oxford English Reader for Africa. We used to read that book, first grade. And it started, the first sentence was, our largest river is the Thames. That's how it started. So many, many years, I kept on asking my father, one day I want to see the Thames, which is supposed to be our largest river here in Malawi. He said, Peter, you have to travel 6,000 miles to, to the UK to see the Thames. 
But that's how we were instructed, and those are the kind of books that we read. I know in the French system of education, one of the books they used to read in French West Africa was Our Ancestors, the Gauls. That's how, again, the mind was structured and programmed. In the other instances, one was supposed to be able to dissect an insect and label its past. In that process, you would qualify as a person and certified as educated. But what's the use of such an education? Unless you want to build a nation of insects. Secondly, we need an education system that empowers the majority of the people beyond the classroom. We will take education to the community. Much of education in Africa has seen the creation of an elite class that almost echoes the idea of Lord Thomas Macaulay in 1835, as I read earlier. What do I mean by the majority? The category of the majority has three dimensions. We have the women who constitute nearly half the population. There is no vehicle that can move with half of its tires not functioning. I'm proud to say that I've pointed out women in key systemic positions in my government. There's no point in educating women. We cannot give them the key decision-making positions. Besides, we have also in intensified investing in the education of the girl child as a means of achieving sustainable empowerment of women. The third dimension of the majority is the youth. In Africa, about 60% of the population is youth and the age of 35. We have a similar situation in Asia. It is the same in Malawi. I believe a time has come, but even planning on education must focus on investing in the youth as a human capital. I'm thinking about how to fast track progress in the developing countries. What I've done in Malawi is introduce a program called Skills Development Targeting the Youth. We are building community technical colleges across the country. We are proud of curriculum, but focus on vocational and entrepreneurial skills. In so doing, we are creating a human engine for industrialization, for us to move Malawi from a predominantly importing and consuming nation to a producing and exporting nation. We are creating a skilled labor force for such a movement. These community colleges are targeting the third dimension of the majority. Because our education system has been elixir since colonialism, there are a lot of Malawians stuck without skills between the secondary school and the university. This is the majority that finish secondary school but cannot get into the university. We have to target this group also. I believe there is no society that can develop without a skilled labor force. Above all, I believe in empowering communities, empowering women, and empowering the youth. I thank you for your attention. Well, Your Excellency, thank you very much for your address. Um, we now have an opportunity for some questions, um, both from the audience, and I, I'll moderate that, and I'll also put forward a few um, thoughts for His Excellency to share on as well. So if you do have any um, questions you'd like to offer in relation to His Excellency's speech, then uh, please do raise your hands. Do we have uh, any volunteers? Um, okay, yeah, the, the person sitting there behind the, the bench. Please wait for the microphone to come along first. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, and welcome to Oxford. Uh, my name is Janie Hampton, and I'm the patron of the Association of Malawians in Britain. Um, I'm sure you're aware that one of the main reasons why girls don't go to school in Malawi is because we have wombs and we have menstrual periods. And in Malawi, they miss as many days from their periods as they do from malaria. 
But are you also aware that as from last week, Malawi Girl Guides, of whom your First Lady is the patron, are now leading the world in promoting menstrual cups to help girls stay at school through their work in the Girl Guide movement. Thank you. Yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, you're absolutely right uh, that uh, when a girls reach that age, uh, during parts of the month, many miss school, two or three days of school. There's no question about it. Now, my government has embarked on a project of toilets for girls' schools. We are targeting this year over 500 schools where toilets for girls are being built and will, will be built. So that will take care of that. But on that also, we are embarked on a project to protect the girl child that no girl should walk more than five kilometers or two and a half miles. Because studies have shown that if girls walk more than five kilometers going to primary school, over 50% of them drop before they finish primary school. So intervening, building girls' hostels, and the First Lady and her foundation are very active with others in building girls' hostels around the country. We still have a long way to go, but at least we have started. But you're quite right. Uh, the, the issue raised is an extremely important one. Thank you. We appreciate your help to all girls. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have another question from the audience? Uh, yeah, let's go to the, the hand here on the second row. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is uh, Musawali Kamfose, and I'm a graduate here at Oxford. Um, I just had uh, um, one or two questions to ask, really. Uh, the first, in your statement at the EU, EU, you alluded to the fact that in Africa and indeed Malawi needed uh, some skilled uh, labor uh, for, for it to improve, uh, which you, you have also uh, indicated here. I just wonder um, what, um, what is the way forward in case of, um, you know, say, for example, what is happening at uh, Chancellor College in, uh, in case, uh, uh, as an example, to see what is the way forward so that that uh, can improve Malawi in the long run. And of course, um, my second uh, 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 comment, of course, on the issue of uh, what has been happening in the past, i.e. on the colonialism and uh, okay. how on the uh, colonial, uh, on your co colonial um, history as to what, oh. uh, um, in, in terms of how money is coming back to the to the to, 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 to the EU as 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 an example to see what is it that African leaders are doing and what is it uh, in Malawi in particular is doing to address uh, that need. Thank yeah. you. Well, on the first issue uh, of Chancellor College. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complex issue. Uh, as you know, uh, in Malawi, the head of state is the chancellor of the, or the public university. So I'm, chan I'm chancellor of um, uh, uh, Chancellor College, uh, University of Malawi, uh, and there are serious labor issues there. What happened, the, the professors there demanded parity with the professors in the medical school. You know, in terms of science, you know, the professors in the medical school in addition to teaching, they also do clinical work. They see patients and so forth. So they're paid extra. So the, the rest of the faculty wanted parity. They should also get 40% uh, more uh, to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to balance it, uh, equalize with the... So a lawyer was appointed, uh, a very distinct lawyer, and he concluded that, uh, that those allowances would be abolished uh, so that uh, there would be parity. Uh, and that uh, if necessary, the Ministry of Health or somebody else would pay for the extra clinical work uh, that they do in addition to teaching. So um, the other professors said no, and uh, now they're demanding, I believe, a 30% increase, uh, which we, we, we cannot afford. Um, as, as you know, we are facing challenges uh, in Malawi after donor flight, after casket, and so forth. So we're discussing the matter, and I know the parents have asked to see me. Uh, I'll see them next week. Um, I think we would like to try to find a way out of this, but it, it, it'll have to be compromised. Uh, there are no absolutes in, in life um, that uh, we have to meet each other more than halfway in terms of the salary, in terms of our economy, uh, and then we'll take care of that. Now, the second question you asked about the colonial 
type of education, what, what leaders in Africa are doing about it. Right. Yes. Uh, so, so I was just alluding to the fact uh, that you said um, uh, some of the money that uh, comes uh, that goes to Africa or indeed Malawi, it uh, eventually comes back to 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 the Western uh, world. Uh, it doesn't necessarily stay in Africa, for example. Uh -huh. um, so I just wanted. To, oh, oh, I just wanted to find out w w what exactly. Yeah, yeah. You're you know, doing you know that's a very, 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 very interesting problem. You see, you, you, Africa gets about 134 billion a year, or US dollars um, in aid and um, investments uh, and what have you. 134 billion, but 194 billion goes out of Africa. Every year, through externalization, through illegal uh, transfer pricing, through all sorts of uh, Mickey Mouse type of deals that are taking place. And an extremely difficult problem. Uh, and the uh, African Union appointed a commission, um, chaired by former president, that Tabon Bay, of South Africa. He's working on it. And they established that in Malawi alone, and there just was always coming every year, over 25 billion is being taken out of Malawi through all these illegal transactions, transfer pricing, uh, and all sorts of things involving a lot of companies, uh, in, including some uh, from here, uh, that are uh, operating in Malawi. So we're, we're trying to close the loopholes, um, uh, do something about it, but it's it really a very, very serious matter. It's very, very serious matter. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I have another question. Let's go to the member seated on the second row over there, the T-shirt. Um, I'd just like to begin by thanking His Excellency for a really interesting um, speech. Um, so my question is in a similar vein to um, the previous question. Uh, it's generally agreed that there is a um, historical amnesia with respect to um, British colonial influence around the world, particularly in Africa. Um, what do you see as the, um, the solution to this problem? How, how, how um, what programs in education, for example, do you think could be implemented to um, provide a much more balanced um, uh, a view, of, view of history um, uh, with respect to British colonial history? Uh, it's very interesting, but here, on March 9th last year, here at Oxford University, you all marched to go and destroy the, the statue of Cecil Rhodes. Uh, probably the biggest imperialist in the history uh, of, of uh, uh, colonialism. You wanted to demolish that statue. But there, there are all these buildings here. You are enjoying that built by Cecil Rhodes. Uh, and we have the, 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 the will that he wrote, which finds the Rhodes scholarships. There are some of you are on, on those scholarships. So what do you do in a situation like that? So um, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that it's much more complicated. Um, uh, to erase the, the kind of dehumanization uh, that colonial education created. Even today, even today, not only in Malawi, but in Africa, and I'm sure probably also in Asia and Latin America, there's a belief that everything foreign, especially from Europe, is more superior than something from elsewhere. That used to be uh, that kind of mentality. Uh, it, it's changed. I remember when um, um, I, I, I spent most of my time in, in the United States, but also in Africa. For example, in, in auto industry, when Japanese started making cars, the Honda uh, and the Koreans, the Kia, nobody wanted to buy them. Even I said, no, you know, they, they can't make good cars. It's only the Rover, uh, the Jaguar, Mercedes Benz, Audi. BMW, those are the only cars that uh, are really worth uh, that. But now it's changed. Uh, it's changed now, and people realize that Japanese cars and uh, Korean cars are very good and durable and also very nice looking. Now, the point I'm saying, it will take a long time for people to, to, to change this mentality that uh, something coming from elsewhere or from Europe uh, is not necessarily better than somebody made elsewhere in Africa. It'll take a long time, but, but, but for us to, to raise this, we're going to have to develop skills, be, be entrepreneurial, and be able to make products that are competitive, that add value. That's why I noticed my, my means of industry here is, uh, is nodding, I think, in, in agreement with what I've said. Uh, that we have to make products which have high value, 
through our skills of training, which are competitive. Once we do that, then people know that uh, a car or whatever, a cloth, whatever instrument made in Malawi is as good as the one ordered from Germany or, or Britain or United States. It, it'll take that. that. That's why I'm, I'm talking about skills training. Move away uh, from um, classical education, which is good also. But entrepreneurial training, I'll give you a good example. I won't mention the country, but a friend of mine, one of the presidents, um, as usual, presidents in, in Africa are not my chancellors of universities, which of course are titular, uh, not an executive position, but he went to one of the universities and he found uh, 23 graduates. It was, it was the first graduation cohort of that university. 23 people graduated and he asked them what they majored in. And out of the 23, 21 had majored in religious studies. You see, and the president said, I mean, we love God, but we cannot train people, resources like this, for people to be studying religion only. We also need to teach people other things, technology, and so forth. I know here, your own university here, about 20, 20, 30 years ago, when that Saudi Arabian guy, Hassan, wanted to endow a shell of business, there was a commotion here at this university because they say Cox University cannot teach business. It's supposed to teach people uh, abstract things like um, philosophy, history, literature, but not business. And yeah, that's dirty. That's not for a university like this. So now, it's changing. So it's a change of mindset that I'm talking about. All of us everywhere, uh, both here and also in the third world, if we can, in fact, uh, change our mental attitude, uh, some of these misconceptions can, can be erased. They can be erased, uh, and, uh, and I, I think we, we better, until we do that, uh, until we do that, um, I, I, I think we, we're going to continue. In a way, the African situation today, the African condition today, I think it's a, it's a result of that kind of mental castration that took place over three or 400 years of, of colonial exploitation uh, in Africa and Asia. It's now changing, uh, but it'll take time and a lot of effort on the part of all of us. Thank you. Let's go to the hand on the back row over there. Thank you very much for speaking to us today, uh, Your Excellency. Um, my, my question is, what role do you see China playing in Malawi's development over the next few years uh, in areas such as education, I believe? Uh, in 2011, uh, there was a, a loan made from, uh, of about 70 uh, million US dollars for the construction of a university, science and technology university in Malawi, as well as previously a, a highway as well, uh, yeah. eight, a 70 million dollar highway or so. Uh, so what role do you see China playing uh, in, in areas such as this China. in helping uh, Malawi to develop? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. In, in fact, China is playing a very important role. I remember in 2007, uh, I, I, I came here to give a lecture at Hertford College. And from here, I, I, I flew straight to China. We had gone a, on a secret visit where we were trying to uh, change our relations from relations with Taiwan to uh, People's Republic of China. That was 2007, and we, we did that. Um, and uh, uh, through that, China has begun to help us in a number of areas, infrastructure, right? Education. Uh, one of the universities we have created Malawi University of Science and Technology had been funded by the by, by, by Chinese uh, and is doing wonderful work. And many other projects, uh, infrastructure and others, uh, I think the Chinese are committed uh, to, to explain the area of infrastructure. Uh, I, I think that all over Africa, they are engaged in major projects um, uh, to, to change the, the sort of uh, African economies and enable them to grow. Now, that complements, of course, uh, the assistance we have always received from our friends in, in the West, United States, but also Europe, and Western institutions like the World Bank, IMF, um, and other board, the European Investment Bank, and so forth. So it complements each other. Um, and I, I think in the end, um, we were also glad the other day to see the Chinese ambassador and the, the EU ambassador in Malawi, they're funding a joint project on irrigation. 
And they went there together to inspect it because we are trying to move away. In Malawi, you probably know that for the last two years, we have suffered, um, there was food insecurity because they of drought. So we are trying to move into irrigation now, move away from red fed agriculture. Uh, and the Chinese and the European Union are working together. Uh, so I'm, I'm very glad to do that. Uh, 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 and I think the, the, the program the Chinese are doing uh, complements our traditional you know, supporters in the West. And together, uh, I think it's beginning to show positive results, not, not in Malawi, but all over Sub Saharan Africa, really. Yeah. Thank you. Let's have another question from the um, member on the second row over there. Um, thank you for your speech, Your Excellency. Um, I'm a graduate student here from Zimbabwe. And I have a question just in regards to the last question that's been asked. I think a lot of the questions are about how we talk about engagement with outside actors and how we talk about China and EU relations. And I'm wondering what your take in terms of building endogenous growth regionally through regional integration, through you know, looking at ways of instrumentalizing relationships like SADC, like the AU, to build growth for Africans that looks in rather than out. Yeah, um, th that's very important. We, we are uh, committed. Uh, Malawi is a, is a member of SADC, Southern African Development uh, uh, Community, uh, also a member of the COMESA, Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, but also just recently in Shanghai, Czech, in Egypt, we signed the tripartite uh, agreement for 26 African countries uh, together for a common market, and we're now negotiating a continent wide market for the whole African continent. We'll do that in two years. However, there are challenges. You see, as you know, in a country like Malawi, the main source of income or revenue is taxes and duties. Now, duties form a very important part, excise, duties, customs duties, a big part of our revenue. Now, when you enter into a common market and you have zero tariffs, then it creates problems where do you find alternative uh, revenue? Uh, for the times that have not been suspended. So this is where we are now, working out uh, uh, at the African Union in January, we discussed this, to find how to compensate those countries uh, that are weak and able. You see, uh, for you to take advantage of these markets, you must have something to sell there. If you're not manufacturing anything, it doesn't make any sense to have a market. You know, so going on in industrialization, value addition, uh, for us in Malawi in agriculture, mostly. We do that by addition, so we have products that can be sold uh, somewhere else. Um, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to talk about integration. So we're working on it. Um, it, it's a, it, 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 it takes a long time. You know, the European Union here, it goes back to Schumann Plan, about 1952 and so forth. In fact, before that, the Europeans, a coal and steel community, going back 1947 for take. But I've evolved now to a common market and a union, very advanced. We are moving, uh, but we face special challenges because of our weak internal economies. Uh, but we're moving in that direction. Thank you. Let's have um, another question. Right, we'll go to the, the hand, just the row in front there. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, brain drain. And I will preface my uh, question by saying, wherever I travel around the world, I see African professors, African doctors, African judges, African lawyers, but they're not in Africa. My question is, what do you think are the causes of the brain drain, and what is Malawi doing to stop their its best brains living Malawi? In the brain drain? Well, well I think I'm a living example uh, that I left an endowed professorship at a major American university to return to Malawi and work there. I'm working in Malawi now, so that's a good example. Uh, but on a more serious note, uh, it's a serious problem, uh, and we are, we're working. Um, um, in, in September, uh, at the UN General Assembly, 70, I'll be addressing, we're applying a conference of Malawians in the diaspora. We'll be meeting in Washington, uh, to encourage them uh, about opportunities in Malawi, either short term or long term. Uh, and I know the UN has also some funding on this, 
to encourage Africans in the diaspora to come back to their countries for short-term commitments or long-term commitments. It's, it's, not, it's very difficult uh, for people to, to leave uh, uh, after they have been in these countries for, for many years. But it's happening. Uh, it's happening, but, but also we encourage people. You see, India um, got where it is, and so is China, because of uh, uh, transmissions uh, and so forth from, from the people in the diaspora. So the India, or investment, uh, and China, and it's very strange, it's the overseas Chinese, from places like Vancouver, the United Kingdom, and so forth, who bought a lot of money, sent a lot of money to China, and benefited a lot um, in Ethiopia, it's happened in Uganda, in a few countries. So we, 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 we would like to have our people back, but you know, we know, short term, long term. But if not, it will make it easier for them to invest uh, in, in Africa and we'll open foreign currency accounts. Uh, and now in Malawi, we have that. Right? So that it makes it easier for them to bring the money and to withdraw it if they want to, without going through all sorts of of difficulties, but it is a, a problem uh, and we are certainly trying to address it. Thank you. Let's have a, another question. Okay, let's go to the, um, no, let, let's go to the hand on the back there. Thank you very much for your speech, Your Excellency. My name is Sakim Kosi. I'm a graduate student from South Africa here at Oxford. Um, my question relates to, it, it touches a bit on the question that was asked earlier about regional integration in Africa. Um, as you may know, the South African economy is one of many economies in, in Africa that are struggling to generate economic growth uh, at a macro GDP level. And in, in a country like South Africa, where there are investors who may want to uh, seek returns on the investments in other parts of the, of the continent, what message would you have for them regarding investing in Malawi? So where, where do you think um, good returns and investment and growth is happening in terms of industries and, and, and re geographical areas of the country in Malawi? Yeah. Now, very good question. Now, we want to encourage uh, investors. Uh, we mentioned South Africa, uh, where you are from. There are many South African companies that are investing in Malawi also. But we were attracting uh, investors from, every year we, we have uh, uh, an investment forum which the Minister of Trade uh, uh, organizes for investors from over the world. Uh, and the last year we had one especially for China and we'll have another one in no, no, November. Now, I, I think the message is that, uh, you see, Africa, uh, the rate of return for investment in Africa um, while the global rate of return is 8%, for Africa it's over 30%. Because there's cheap labor and the resources are right there. Uh, so that invest in Africa or in Malawi is very, very, very lucrative. Now, in Malawi what we are doing is we have a number of uh, measures. Uh, for example, we have created now a one-stop investment center. Before it used to take about six or five days. From the time you applied uh, for an investment license to the time you received it. Now it can take as, 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 as little as five days. And this is a complicated investment involving, say, land transactions. So we're trying to make it easy. Uh, we're trying to make immigration laws easy. You know, one stop center. That means you go there, immigration is there, revenue department is there, land department is there. So you move from room to room in the same building. And so running all over town trying to get uh, an investment done. Um, so we're doing that um, and it's working very well. But also we have, uh, you see, because we're part of the coal market, if you invest in Malawi, for example, uh, you really have access uh, to a, a huge market, not only in the commercial study, as I mentioned, uh, African market, but also globally, for example, even to American market and Goa. You see, we have access to that but also the European market under what they call EBA, Everything But Arms Initiative of the, of the European Union. Uh, and we have bilateral arrangements with China, India, Japan. So an investor in Malawi has access to a global market. 
in terms of their goods. Uh, so that's important. Now, investors worry about two things. They worry about investment over their, uh, their uh, security, both physical security, but also investment security, commercial. Now, we don't have laws anymore that threaten investment either through creeping taxation or something, any of those gimmicks. That's gone. That was in the 60s, not now. So an investment is very secure uh, from a commercial point of view. Uh, from a physical point of view, I've guaranteed myself to investors that if you come to invest in Malawi, that will make sure you are safe uh, at your house, uh, at your office, and in between. Uh, that's complete security, because Malawi is an extremely stable country. There are no linguistic, ethnic, uh, religious conflicts in Malawi. You know, so I think that's a message I uh, say that uh, investors are welcome. Now, there are very exciting areas now going on in agriculture, for example, uh, in, in health sector, via addition, infrastructure, education, all those are areas that are tremendous opportunities for, for investment. So uh, I, I certainly uh, would, 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 do, would encourage uh, uh, investors to come. And I would encourage you, if you have some, yeah, as a student, you probably don't have a lot of money, but uh, <laughs> when you finish and uh, make a lot of money, come to my own and invest. Uh, you'll be welcome there. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions. So let's go to the lady here on the, the second row, the shirt. Uh, thank you so much for your insightful speech today. Uh, I'm a Zambian student at Oxford as well. Um, so my question related to um, the commodity cycle, a lot of uh, economies in Southern Africa are dependent on commodities and um, the demand for it and on big consumers like China. Uh, do you think the way, forward, uh, the way forward for development is to break away from these commodity cycles? And if so, do you think the answer is re-industrialization and capitalism or is there a more um, perhaps sustainable model that uh, African countries could follow. Thank you very much. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think um, certainly, the, you know, the capitalism, socialism stuff, you, we, we tried that, you remember, in the 60s. All over Africa, we had nationalizations and, you know, the, the sort of commanding heights took over controlling tourism or insurance or manufacturing. Uh, all over Africa, there were nationalizations. It, it didn't work. Um, uh, U.S. Nyerere, I'm sure you have read his famous Ujamaa books and so on. It did not work. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think um, we, we have decided now, I, 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 you know, two years ago I addressed a meeting on Wall Street and, and I started by saying that 20 years ago when I was a student, I would not have gone to Wall Street because uh, I went to school during the days of radicalism and I considered capital, capitalism an enemy. So we're against Wall Street and any kind of capitalism. But, but I said, uh, I now come as a friend. Uh, I've changed my mind. There's nothing wrong with changing my mind. Uh, things have now changed. And uh, certainly there's only one model now, economic model, I think, and that is really free enterprise. Um, but the enterprise which includes other people, includes women, includes minorities, includes disabled people, includes people who have normally been marginalized. Uh, I, that can be done, but uh, I, I think that's a model today that um, industrialization, investment, uh, value addition, uh, but making sure that there's participation, access to credit by those who have not been excluded, access to credit. I think that's the only way that Africa has to go now. I don't really see a, any other way. Uh, and, 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 and I think the last few years, I think I've seen growth uh, since the abandonment of uh, all those nationalizations and one-party states uh, in the 70s and mid-80s, we see growth all over Africa now. You know, Kenya, Malawi, Zimbabwe, South Africa. We, we see growth because of infusion of foreign capital. Uh, but it must be foreign capital which is not exploitative, uh, which is sensitive. Uh, to uh, everybody in society, a diverse society. But that's the way we are going, uh, and, and I think that's probably the, the only realistic way uh, in the world today. 
Um, go, going back to your um, speech, a final question from me. We were talking about the, the challenge of global education and equal access to education around the world. Right. But it seems that the responses are very fragmented and on an individual country by country basis. Yeah. Obviously, this is an issue that requires the world's you know, attention. Mm -hmm. What needs to be done to catalyze action on this so that people talk about global equal access to education in the same vein as climate change and other issues which we recognize require multilateral um, coordinated responses? No, you're absolutely right. Um, as you know, I, I may not have mentioned this, but there's a Global Commission on Education, which is, uh, which is uh, chaired by right, right, right Honorable uh, Gordon Brown. I'm a member of that commission, uh, with the Prime Minister of Norway, uh, the President of Chile and Indonesia, and the Director General of UNESCO. We are working on a model for financing education. Uh, you see, because of limited resources, we realize no individual country can money to finance education anymore. It's, it's too complicated and too expensive. So what we are doing is now there are 14 pilot countries that have been selected. The first stage to see how to, to, uh, to finance education. Now, I, at, at the UN last year uh, in September, we had the first meeting and we had people like Aliko Dangote from Nigeria, uh, what people like uh, uh, Ma, what's his first name? The guy who owns, uh, he's China. Um, he's a, Jack Ma? Jack Ma, yes, yes. Uh, what's the name of his company? Um, this company that- Alibaba? Alibaba, that's right, Alibaba. Jack Ma of Alibaba um, and, and many others. Uh, they were there, um, we're talking about now, and the president of the World Bank, and uh, try to get uh, the, the, the private sector to get involved in this. I think for a long time, they, the, the, the private sector has sort of, you know, stood apart and said, this is not our responsibility. Uh, that this uh, responsibility of, of the government. I don't think that's any longer realistic. I think the private sector must get involved. So in this commission, um, there are many private sector groups, and uh, I think they will finalize the report now, which will be discussing in September this year. So, uh, I think that that's the way to go, but no single country can manage anymore uh, to, to run uh, and finance education because it's simply too, too expensive. Uh, we need to pull down resources together. And, and I think that's happened, and what will happen is there will be a, a, a new facility, a global fund to finance education, just like we have the climate, the green fund for climate change. Uh, there will be a fund for education, uh, and which uh, I think uh, countries will be able to access. In addition to also domestic participation, where we need to get the private sector, because after all, the private sector benefits uh, from having an educated workforce. So they must invest in this, because it's in their own interest that you have a skilled, trained workforce. So we're putting them in now, um, and I think they're coming along, but I, I think that's a, a very good question, yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, unfortunately, um, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, the president has got a very heavily committed itinerary and needs to make his way back out now. Um, but can you please join me uh, first in standing and waiting for the delegation to leave and also thanking the president for coming to speak here today.